Is it time? Right. Good afternoon again. I'm Victoria Schofield, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with Harriet Sands, Isambard Wilkinson, and TJ Jahangir. We're here, in fact, to launch Bard, if we might be friendly, um, Bard's book, Travels in a Dervish Cloak. Here we are. Um, if you haven't already bought it, I suggest you do, because it's a great read. I read it about a year ago, and um, I think I know you're all, you know, especially everyone who is from Pakistan, it's, it's always a sort of a tricky thing when a foreigner writes about Pakistan. But I think what I found so wonderful about Bard's book is how authentic it is and how you can really see yourself into being a foreign correspondent, arriving in Pakistan, wanting to work in Pakistan, and how you actually manage to work in Pakistan. So we're going to be hearing from Bard and Harriet, who has also just published her Beyond That Last Blue Mountain, My Silk Road Journey. So we've got two memoirs, and TJ is also a travel writer and commentator on the areas on which both, both participants have traveled. So we're looking forward to a really lively discussion. I'm going to open it up to questions probably sooner than the statutory 15 minutes so that you all feel you, know, you can ask any one of the authors here present uh, the questions you'd like to ask. But I'm going to start, as we're launching Bard's book, with that question, which a lot of people have already asked me, um, is why the title? Ah. Well, um, uh, the title, of course, a bit like my name, is a, a little bit pretentious, and, um, but it does relate very uh, deeply to uh, Pakistan and indeed to this uh, city. Um, and I'm going to answer it um, a little bit cheaply by reading from my book straight away, which is usually a no-no. But basically, after about a, a year of living in Pakistan, um, I had been trying to work out what is the essence of this country, what makes it tick. Um, obviously, to an outsider, it was a complete um, enigma, a sort of mixture and a, a palimpsest of histories and uh, languages and ethnicities. Um, but the sort of prism through which I began to look at it through was uh, Sufism. And I, I came to Lahore, um, and I visited the shrine of uh, Data Saab, and later on, a friend gave me a tract uh, written by him. And in it, uh, he described um, this, which, which I'll now read. Um, so I was, I, I was reading through this book, and, and, and probably there's people here who have read uh, his, his uh, tract of writing. And it's, some bits are turgid, some are unbearable, and some are just absolutely inspirational. So, so I was reading through this book, and... He, he was saying things like, it's fine to throw off your clothes under the intoxicating influence of religious ecstasy, and you can dance when that agitation is neither dancing, nor foot play, nor bodily indulgence, but a dissolution of the soul. It was then that I came across a passage about the significance of a dervish's cloak. He said, all the mysteries of the universe could be found in such a patched garment, containing as it does the earth sun and moon, and all the stages of the path to truth. The country itself seemed like a patchwork of peoples living along threads of rivers and in the folds of mountains, imagining the universe in myriad ways. I saw myself traversing the cloak, grappling with it, trying to understand it, and sometimes getting lost in it. So... To answer that your definitely, question. that's that's very good. Unlike a lot of people who never answer the question, you've definitely have answered the question <laughs> there. So um, that, that's interesting. But your your story goes back um, in terms of why you wanted to come to Pakistan, and as from from what I understand, you took quite a long time to put it into effect because, um, as you also write in the book, you had a nostalgia for a country you'd never visited, and this is all because of your grandmother and a very special that she, friend that she had. So perhaps mm. you could tell us about how it all began. Yes, um, my grandmother is to blame for it all. Um, and the journey starts with her, probably about 5,000 miles away from here, um, in a wet and boggy bit of island um, on which her house stands. Her house, rather like she was, was um, a kind of eccentric hodgepodge affair. She built on top of a a 17th century tower 
And if you were to go into her house, you'd start seeing some of the clues uh, to, uh, to this book and to her own story. You would see, for example, uh, Adrak uh, fabrics, um, other Indian fabrics, perhaps a tiger's head, uh, a spittoon, maybe a shapely arch uh, uh, pointed over a window. And you would, you would uh, immediately get a sort of, the subcontinent would uh, come at you in the middle of this Irish bog. And the reason was, which um, uh, she, she was born in India um, in, in the 1920s, as was her grandmother and her grandmother. She was um, Anglo-Indian, which is to say she was of uh, European and Indian uh, blood. And um, she, she, if, if you were to uh, have stayed with her, and uh, typical to uh, subcontinental um, emotional warmth, she would have people to stay for years, not days, um, you would probably notice her penchant for chili, chutney, and high tea. <laughs> and so she, she uh, although she left the Indian subcontinent in uh, 1947 at uh, partition, she brought with her to Ireland all of her uh, Anglo-Indian and uh, subcontinental uh, DNA. And this all continued... All the paraphernalia, too. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, and all the paraphernalia. And, um, I mean, she raised us uh, listening to... Uh, nursery rhymes in um, Hindi and Urdu, and and told stories about um, uh, picnics on uh, uh, tiger-infested lakes, and uh, jaunts up uh, 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 railway tracks into the hills. So, but but the the uh, subcontinental aspect of her life was kept uh, very much alive by her 50-year uh, friendship with a uh, matriarch from Lahore, who I've called the the uh, Begum. Um, and every year the Begum would come and stay with us in Ireland, and my grandmother, well into her late 80s, um, used to come to Lahore every year. And so... And famously, I, she accompanied... She asked you to accompany her. Yeah, so... Um, and, and then, when I was about 18, I came uh, for a wedding, and, and that sort of sense of nostalgia, that image of, uh, of the subcontinent that I had been uh, brought up with, um, I very much sort of saw it and... Uh, lapped it all up and became very quickly hooked, aged 18. But then, of course, comes the, the career as a journalist. You had to, obviously, grow up and get a job and work as a journalist. But the impetus to come back, I, I think you were working in Spain at the time and thought it was all rather boring and that Pakistan was the place to be. Yeah, I should, I should just quickly add, uh, uh, not for sympathy votes, but, but uh, for the record. So I'd actually, um, in my mid-20s, I, I kept coming back to Pakistan, and I decided to live here and uh, travel through Pakistan. But literally, I'd been here a couple of months, and I got kidney failure, had to return to my grandmother's house, had dialysis, a transplant, all that. And my consultant in Dublin said, never go back to Pakistan, it's a dangerous place, it'll be the end of you. And so I didn't for a while. And then I was working in Spain, and... Um, of course, as you know, sort of, it, it was about uh, two th the end of 2005, so Pakistan was going through a very uh, troubled time, and my editor said, well, aren't you Pakistani or something? Uh, <laughs> off you go. So, uh, yeah, so I decided yes. to come back. No, I think, I think one of the things that, uh, when I start reading a book, I actually always read the acknowledgements first, and one of the most unusual acknowledgements happens to be in, in Bard's book, because he thanks everybody you're supposed to thank, and his editor, and his friends, and everyone who's read the manuscript, and the publisher, etc. And then, sort of towards the end, I believe, is thanks to his brother, who gave him a kidney. And I think yes. that is... Yeah, I owe him a, a, a vital organ. A vital organ, yes, yes, a vital organ. And that I, so I was reading this before I even began the book. I mean, obviously I was going to be interested in the book as it was on Pakistan, but I remember thinking, oh, this is unusual um, for that. Now, Harriet, I'm just going to bring you in because you, you also had a, a sort of a moment when you weren't sure what you were doing and a certain cer set of circumstances brought you to come to Pakistan, which is the fruits of your life in Pakistan. And... Um, I think it's, it's interesting how there are, I mean, a handful, I mean, there are a number of foreigners, half foreigners, um, like us, who get inspired to come, and then you just love the place and never want to go. And you spent more or less eight years here. Um, I was brought up in the English Lake District, and uh, I had a wonderful teacher, art teacher, and she used to bring shards of pottery to class, which she'd picked up on her expeditions through Persia on archaeological digs. 
and I was really interested at age nine in these shards of pottery. And when I was 23, she contacted me and said, I'm taking a group to Afghanistan to visit all the archaeological sites. And I remember when you were a little girl, you were interested in pottery and unusual stones and old glass and things. So uh, I went for two weeks with a small group throughout Afghanistan. And then... Um, at a it time when Afghanistan was... Yes, 1977. 1977, so two yes. years before the Soviet invasion. And after the Soviets entered Afghanistan, I joined a small group of volunteers in London who ran a quarterly newsletter called Afghan Refugee Information Network. And after a few years of working for them as a volunteer, I said one day at a committee meeting, do you know, I would love to go back to Pakistan and see what's happened to the situation with the Afghan refugees. And one of the committee members said, well, if you do decide to go, I've collected together a little bit of money to give to a um, humanitarian aid organization working with refugees. So I took the money in an envelope um, and uh, uh, rang a number when I got to Islamabad. And the humanitarian aid organization turned out to be one of the seven political parties, Jamiat Islami. <laughs> and um, the moment came for me to hand over the money and I told them in advance that I was bringing some money, and um, all the elders of the, of the group had been assembled to greet me, and we were, they were seated around a huge, highly polished shisha wood table, and the moment came for me to hand over the envelope, and um, it was passed like past the parcel, all the way down from one gentleman to the next, until it got to the man at the head of the table and he slit it open with a paper knife and out fluttered 60 pounds and there was a gasp around oh. the table I think they thought I was bringing sort of 6,000 6, pounds. pounds and I just wished I'd asked the girl in London to tell me how much um, she had put in the envelope of course it was just collected from various you know donations um, but they um, I said I'm going to Bashar and they said well when you arrive in Bashar ring this number we have a representative and it turned out to be Masood Khalili, who was a close friend of the Lion of the Panjshir, Ahmed Shah Masood. He'd just come back from fighting two years with Ahmed Shah Masood in the Panjshir Valley. And he was the spokesperson to greet and meet um, visiting journalists. And he looked after me for four days, took me around <clears throat> the hospitals and the um, refugee camps and the orphanages. And um, <clears throat> I, I think really that experience changed my life, I think. Yes, it's, it's experiences like this, it's, that's what books are made of. And um, it, it, it's something unusual that you can't actually decide you're going to do it and prescribe it. It suddenly happens. Um, TJ, travel writer, you, you, you know, you've also included your memoirs in your work and you also traveled as a Pakistani in these areas. How difficult is it when you're, when you're writing to encapsulate uh, what you've seen to make it accessible to somebody who may not have been there? Mm, well, you see, there are, a, you know, you see a Pakistan, which is the main cities. So it's all developed, it's hotels and restaurants. And then you step into the rural areas like you have, and you find another world. Gone are the normal creature comforts, but there is a wealth of hospitality which opens up. And people will welcome you into their houses, they'll feed you, they'll guide you, they'll take you to the next village <clears throat> and, you know, give you all manner of support. So it's very easy. The difficult part is to get off the five-star hotels and the four-star hotels and the willingness to be able to take a journey or an adventure mm. without any fixed um, resting points or, you know, target sort of yeah. uh, places. And uh, I've done much, you know, like my friend here, uh, traveled to places which I've always fantasized about, gone there, and sure enough, people turn up, help you, and it carries on. It's not just here. I think even in other parts of the world, the same thing happens. There are very few people in the world who are that arrogant that they don't like foreigners. As long as they are assured that you're not there to criticize or to uh, take away something from them. Just to look at what they're doing and be interested in it, they're very, they're, you know, they'll welcome you with open arms. 
Yes, I mean, I'm wondering which is the more, you know, if one's talking about which is, which is the more authentic Pakistan, is it what you see in the cities where the government takes place, or is it actually in these, these rural areas where life is simpler? It's harder, but it's, it's simpler, and it's, it's more, more welcoming. I certainly find that both here in Pakistan and, yeah. and in Afghanistan. I'm just wondering, because, Bar, you, what you used to do, you did your duties for the Daily Telegraph when you ended up here as, as a foreign correspondent, but your greatest pleasure was looking at the map with your brother, a photographer, mm. and thinking, where am I going to go? Yes, no, I, um, un unfortunately, as the uh, communications have, have improved um, and were improving, my boss had more of an idea where I was, uh, <laughs> whereas I could quite happily uh, pretend I was in Islamabad, but actually be in uh, Baluchistan or somewhere <laughs> like that. But, but yes, I mean, I mean uh, for me, of course, I mean, urban and rural uh, Pakistan, they both um, are, they, yeah, they both have their own stories. And um, I, I, I could find some, for example, I was amazed to find two fascinating shrines on either side of Islamabad, a city which is notoriously less exuberant than others. Um, and um, th there is life uh, to be found everywhere. I mean, in, um, and of course, I'm sp uh, specifically referring to uh, Gulra Sharif, uh, which I was expecting to be a very dull uh, uh, sort of a place. And it, it turned out to be, t uh, to give a huge insight into how one aspect of uh, Pakistan works. And there, I mean, I saw things like, for example, uh, tennis table bats, which, with which they were trying to beat uh, gins out of people. And also these uh, small I had, for want of a better word, prayers uh, written on pieces of paper and dissolved in water and uh, given for healing properties. And the chief of that shrine, uh, who was very reluctant to speak to me, um, I think his father had a penchant for uh, railway tracks for, and, for, and, and for railways. And, and his, his sort of a mission statement that he would, whether you were in the first or second bogey, he would be able to get you to heaven. But it seemed that his... his his real operation was actually one of uh, a patronage where he, if, if you gave him a certain amount of uh, money, he might be able to sort of use his influence among his uh, disciples to get you a level 22 job in the civil service or something like that. <laughs> so, so again, I mean, there wasn't just a spiritual aspect, and that's why I found these shrines such interesting uh, prisms. I mean, in terms of, because you, you do, you make a point of saying that what really interested you was finding you know, the Sufism and the Sufist aspect of, of Pakistani culture uh, through the prism through which you saw Pakistan. Mm. And one of your searches was the Pir of Pagaro. Uh, mm. What inspired that in particular? Um, okay, let, do I, how far do I have to go back? Um, so that, I, I'd heard of... Uh, uh, Pir Pagara when I was a young boy because um, my father when he was a very young officer was one of the uh, soldiers who was sent to try and find him in interior sin so I kept hearing this this um, hunt for a saint and then when I came to Pakistan I heard the stories told that when I think it was Ayub Khan went to um, uh, Pir Jogot he was warned by his the Hur Murids that he shouldn't walk in front that the president shouldn't walk in front of him, otherwise they would kill him. Um, so I got this, and of course the extraordinary history of the Hoor insurgency during the Second World War, which is a completely unknown uh, chapter of yes, it's it, very it, imperial history. Um, when, I mean, I'm just uh, connecting with another story. When I was a journalist here, I remember being called in by the major general in charge of nuclear defense, and he was trying to persuade us that this was a very stable part of the world. He said, we have a history of being very uh, pacific. And at that point, there was an insurgency in Baluchistan and Kashmir, the tribal areas, <laughs> and one through, throughout the middle of India. And of course, I mean, this insurgency um, was a key response to, uh, to a British imperialism. Anyway, so I was uh, fascinated in meeting uh, Pia Pagara. It was a hunt, which was actually finally, well, I'll leave it to readers of the book, but yes. I'm, I'm still uh, chasing him. Yes, no, no, and I think very bravely you, you talk about this, and one's wondering whether you ever do, but I'm not going to um, do what's the spoiler um, for it, so, so you must look at that. Harriet, I mean, in terms of your sort of travels, what, what was the biggest surprise when you finally um, decided that you were going to, to stay in, in Peshawar? 
uh, did the stereotypes because one of the problems is that we don't we have a romanticism which is partly from the colonial past but at the same time there's nothing wrong with that nostalgia and romanticism because it inspires one to do things and to learn more um, I think I was uh, not too surprised by Pakistan because I'd already been through Pakistan on my way to Afghanistan but um, I my mother's family, like Isambard, had um, been several generations in India, and my forebear was in the Bengal Native Life in Infantry and was in charge of the baggage during the Army of the Indus and had gone into uh, Afghanistan and uh, was in charge of the pris prisoners for Shah Shuja. So I'd been brought up on these stories, so I was really keen to come back to this area. Um, and. I always remember when the airplane landed at Peshawar Airport and the doors open and the warm air floods in and the lovely smells of Pakistan comes into the cabin of the aircraft, <laughs> I just feel, you know, I'm home. Yes, no, I mean, it's a wonderful thing that, as I said, there are a number of foreigners. I don't know how many there are, a number of, you know, people who've got roots and uh, everything that, they, that we all do feel is that particular smell yeah. in the air. For me, it's always encapsulated when I smell tuberoses. <laughs> I feel I've, I've come home. Uh, but, but TJ, for you, you know, you're, you're, you're authentic. You live here. You Yeah, yeah. You I know. was going to caution Bard that um, he's talking about this peer who writes uh, Arabic sort of script and dips it into the water. His cousin is sitting right here. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I better be careful. <laughs> yes. I was going to caution you, but then I thought I better keep my peace. Um, be careful what and, you and, wish and, for. And, and talking about the two Pakistans, he went to Cambridge with me. Oh. Oh, well, tell us more. Is it, this is the father. This, no, 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 no. This is the cousin who's sitting here, oh. right there. Oh. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, so, I mean, these two Pakistans really mix together. I mean, you think there is one and the other. Of course, there is. There was the other. This one is slowly taking over. Mm. And more's the pity. I think um, rather than uh, improving it, it's spoiling it. But um, uh, yes, I think uh, the real Pakistan is still out there in the villages. Mm. And that's the mindset. Very often, the very s what we call the civilized or developed Pakistan sinks back into that, psychologically speaking when in times of trouble. Yes, I mean, do you think it's... it's but, but through writing and, and, and tra traveling, do you think we, we have the ability to, to make it... I mean, all of you who've, who've written uh, sort of essentially travels, travels, travel, um, make it... Part, part of what we're doing is in order to give it to a wider world so that they understand and learn to love that other Pakistan, or is it merely because one wants to record what one's seen for one's own sake? Well, but the question is not to lo love it. Uh, sorry. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Go. The question is not whether you love it or you don't like it or like it. Obviously, if you like it, you'll go there. If you don't like it, you won't go there again. But uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, our job as a travel writer and his job, which is done very well, um, is to illuminate to you how things work and what happens, what is behind that veil of, uh, you know, the, the formality that you see. And uh, that is very interesting. There are lots of um, uh, secrets that he's been able to shred open and show you that this, behind the facade, there is a real thing and that's quite different. So I think our job is only to record that, and if you enjoy it, you'll enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, well, that's yes. the experience. Read another book, Bard. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, one of the reasons why um, I wrote this book was, was that at the time, so uh, 2006 to 2009, there was uh, very much that black legend about Pakistan, that it was the epicenter of terror and a sanctuary for a global uh, terrorism. So I very much wanted to write a corrective because this was not the Pakistan that I had known um, as a younger man. And, and also it was a time when there was a sort of tide of conservative militancy, which again, it was the, uh, for example, the shrines were in the crosshairs. I think uh, militants um, attacked uh, Saki Sarwa, Sewan Sharif, uh, Data Saab, uh, Baba Rehman, or uh, Rehman Baba in Peshawar. 
And, and so I felt that this, the, the, the Pakistan that I had known as a younger person was sort of under threat. And I wanted to create a portrait of that time uh, that would be enduring and hopefully uh, endearing. Yeah. Yes, no, I mean, I, no, I think that you've achieved. And what I want to get onto is that um, instead of just it being a, a sort of a foreign correspondent view of Pakistan, you have given us the nuts and bolts of what it's like to be a foreign correspondent in Pakistan, which is actually different. It might sound the same, but it's very different. And the, the, the descriptions of arriving, you know, you need to have a house, you need to have a cook, you need to have a driver. Um, you know, you need the driver, hopefully, to get on with the cook. And I think that's one of the... <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, doesn't always happen. Um, and I think that's one of the charming aspects of the book, is that when I read it, I mean, I could identify with a lot of it, but it really shows, you know, for you all as well, how somebody who, who doesn't have backup necessarily arrives and sets up and, and becomes a foreign correspondent and has to tick certain boxes which editors want back in London at the same time as having that intellectual curiosity of wanting to see something different like, putting your finger and looking off, off to the map. So, but um, tell us a little bit about the actual sort of difficulties and challenges of just setting up as a foreign correspondent. Uh, well, I immediately made the mistake of trying to replicate uh, the Begum's household by <laughs> employing, employing as many people as I could, thinking that this would be terribly grand. And bit by bit, my life was completely uh, taken over by my staff. And journalism became a, a thing of the past. Uh, and I spent my entire time in a cycle of uh, rebellion and uh, reprisal and happy times, which were very short. Um, but, but, but then I'm glad that I did it because I was actually Islamabad. Again, it's, it, it's a notoriously sort of a cut-off place from reality. And at least the people who I lived with were... Uh, they led lives which were immediately affected by what was going on in Pakistan, whether they had food or no food, electricity or no electricity. So you, got, so you got close to, to the daily uh, problems of, of people of fairly humble origins that you could see how, how difficult it was for them. Yeah, I mean, that, it, was, it was one aspect, but I mean, there was, I mean, all, all, I mean obviously the, the, the uh, relationship between an employee and uh, an employer is, is uh, uh, far from um, intimate, but, but at least it gave me some sort of sense of, of, uh, of what of they were going through. Yeah. And who, who, who you'd give a holiday to because they needed to go and visit a sick relative. Yeah, or if they'd been beaten up by their cousins who were jealous that they had a parcel of land or if they didn't have electricity in their mohalla. And so it was, yeah. But everything did slightly slow down at the mango season. And I'm mm. going to ask you to read the very clever passage about the mango system, uh, season. But while you're just getting ready for okay. that, Harriet, um, from your point of view, you wrote the book um, to record your memoir and your memories or because you wanted also to show people a different Pakistan, a different absolutely, Afghanistan? Absolutely, because when I started to write it, it was at the time when the British soldiers were being killed in Helmand, coming back to Britain, and I felt the British public didn't really know the Afghanistan that I had experienced. And I wanted to show through my book just the experience that I had had, the kindness, the warmth, the generosity, um, the sort of people I met, the culture, so that I could sort of, in a way, in a small way, sort of sh just show the British public, you know, the Afghanistan that I knew. Um, so that's... Yeah. Now, um, it yeah. is true that there's absolutely nobody I know who hasn't been to Pakistan and come back remarking on how mangoes taste totally different from the supermarket back in <laughs> London. And I think one's very privileged if one's had a Pakistani mango. And what I really loved about Bard's book was his description of the onset of the mango season. <laughs> Bard, over to you. The summer was not without pleasure. Nothing quite defines the season. Mausami Gamor, hot season, like a mango. The intense heat does wonders for the mango tree. The fruit ripens in its skin, plumping out to fat, green, paisley shapes. The first crop is taken off at this unripe stage, while still called umbi. Chutneys and juleps are made, and the umbi is cut, dried on rooftops, and steeped in mustard seal oil for achar to last for the year. 
Mango bugs, chalk white, appear everywhere, leaving entire driveways and gardens stained with yellow paste wherever they are crushed. Soon the last umbies turn to arm, a mango in all its glory. Truckloads arrived from southern Punjab and Sindh. In the countryside, mango festivals were held. Landowners dispatched mangoes in wooden crates stuffed with straw to friends and family. I usually received a crate from a relation of the Begum, Aladitta and Basil, who's my driver and my cook, gave me one or two out of 30 and ate the rest themselves. <laughs> For days, they lounged about in a sticky stupor. I, know, I just think, I mean, yeah, it's brilliant writing, Bard. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it does captivate... Uh, for us, that, that sticky stupor that we all might get in yeah. if we manage to get our hands on two or three mangoes. Um, TJ, uh, d does it seem sort of strange to you that, you know, certain things that you would take for granted are so special, or um, is it just part and parcel of observing, you know, the interaction of diversity and diverse cultures? No, it doesn't seem strange. I think that's what we live through and uh, experience all our lives, uh, we've lived, been very much part of this country and uh, experienced all the things that he's experienced. But what he's done is that he has described it not just as a one week, two weeks visit, but a person who has scratched a little bit under the surface of the country and come up with a little more of the flavor of the country, which is not available in a regular tourist guidebook. Yes, well, exactly. I mean, it's a whole different genre, um, writing one's, one's memoir, and I think f for you also, Harriet, um, rather than just writing a guidebook. Yeah. I mean, a guidebook can be useful, but... Um, so, um, Bard, your, your um, sort of worst and best experience during your time as a foreign correspondent, because, of course, it was unfortunately cut short, and I think we're not spoiling mm. because of the dates... What was, what was the real high point when you were here that you've recorded, that you feel? Um, a very difficult question because um, I enjoyed my time so much and I obviously love coming back. Um, but something that's just jumped into my head was the Urs of Lal Shabazz uh, Kalanda at uh, Sewan Sarif. And that, for me, it was, it was in a very difficult time for Pakistan. Um, and yet hundreds of thousands of people came out and while the Western press um, were sort of saying, you know, this is a dull, dour, increasingly impossible place, here was this wonderful, exuberant expression of a country's soul. And, um, and I got thoroughly stoned as well. So it was... Uh, <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> so that was the best experience. Yeah. And the worst? Yeah. Uh, probably when I lost my driver in Peshawar. Uh, <laughs> The, the, he, um, uh, there was a women's rights uh, protest and I was sitting in the press club and I saw it and I took a fancy to one of the posters so I got hold of one and I was doing an interview so I asked Aladita if he could put the, the uh, poster in the car but my Urdu not being great he disappeared for three, like, uh, three or four hours and <laughs> I couldn't find him anywhere I thought he'd been uh, kidnapped and I finally got hold of him and I said, you know, what's been going on? And he said, well, uh, I thought you wanted me to join the protest, so I've been raising slogans. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing but the unusual. And, and Harriet, what was your worst experience? Uh, oh, I didn't really have any bad experiences in Bashar, but I did have a bad experience in Afghanistan when I had gone to buy oriental carpets in Kabul. And um, I arrived, and uh, on the second day, I think it was, I began to feel unwell. And um, basically, I contracted acute bacterial meningitis, and so I was in a Kabul hospital for two weeks. Ooh. And um, on the first day, they gave me a lumbar puncture, and the, uh, the needle had been used on many people before it was used on me, so it was blunt. And I can even now, in the, in the small hours sometimes, I can hear that noise as it went through the gristle. Oh, um, dear. But um, all I can <laughs> say is... on Afghanistan, not Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, the Sikh doctor who looked after me was fantastic and um, really saved my life, I think. Yeah. Yes, okay, well, we'll blame all that. We'll leave that one with, with, with Afghanistan. Um, 
I'm going to do something unusual, which is to, you know, because this is such a lively session, and I feel sure you'd like to ask, you know, Bard and Harriet and TJ some questions. Um, and, you know, we've got about 20, 25 minutes. So, um, questions? Yes, this gentleman here. Yes, usually. We just wait for the mic. I think we've got a mic. Sorry, I've been a bit. We're just getting the mics ready. I think you can you can all see from you know from from, from the panel that there's, there's just such an energy yes. that, that everybody Hi. feels this when they get outside. Yep. For Isambard, uh, to what extent do you think did you feel Pakistan is a creation of the British Empire? If you did feel that at all? Oh, that's a political question. <laughs> uh, well, well, um, but, but in terms of what you saw and what you felt in yeah, Pakistan, no, no, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so. Let me think. So, I mean, when I first arrived 30 years ago, literally there was a sense that people like my grandmother had just left mm, a room yeah, and that yeah. the seat was still yeah, warm. Yeah. The uh, cantonments had a very uh, colonial feel. Mm -hmm. um, and even the, 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 the Urdu um, uh, language book was sort of uh, telling you to take your servant up to the frontier to quash a rebellion and this sort of thing. I mean, going, to, going more seriously, um, I mean, obviously uh, Pakistan is a product of those uh, very torturous uh, negotiations um, and the, the uh, indecent haste with, with which the British uh, withdrew and absolved themselves of responsibility for this part of the world, Pakistan, and its, and its problems, and its uh, problematic borders are very much the result. I mean, that is, unfortunately, the colonial uh, legacy here, which you're, you are now having to deal with. Uh, so yes, and, uh, unfortunately, very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I just skimmed through the book and realized that you have also been to one of the beautiful districts of Pakistan, which is Chitral. Mm. So is there any memory from Chitral which uh, you think would stay with you for a longer period? Um, I absolutely love uh, Chitral. Yeah. Um, and the, my only thing is I wish that I could cross over the uh, Barogal Pass on foot into the Wakhan and go to the ice caves, which are the source of the, what was called the Oxus uh, River. Um, and my memories, what springs to mind, just incredible hospitality, the, the peace, uh, extraordinary uh, walnut and mulberry trees, and that sense of being close to something wonderfully uh, primeval and stripped of um, excessive um, ideology, uh, bureaucracy. It was just a, a very, uh, uh, clearing place to be. I know historically that hasn't always been the case, as the rulers of Chitral were notoriously fratricidal. Um, but yeah, and I, so uh, probably the, the hospitality, in, in terms of my, my journalistic memory is, I was walking around and a friend from there was saying, look, the, there's Saudi Arabian money uh, coming into this area. They're trying to build mosques and madrasas, and we're worried about that changing the nature of our society. So, and obviously with the uh, Loari uh, tunnel, people are more worried about the encroaching um, erosion of their culture. So I, I think it's that's a perennial towards. problem that, that all countries have of how beneficial is progress. On the one hand, you can't keep countries back, you know, if they want to progress, but there is inevitably a fallout from that progress, which you know, I think we've seen. Was there a question up here? Yes, sorry, just a uh, uh, Hello. Uh, what would you say to young aspirational travel writers who want to travel the world and absorb different cultures while simultaneously financially supporting themselves? And if that's someone's dream, what would you advise them to do? Um, right, I think you can, oh, yes, we can have that yeah, answer. Sure, sure, yeah. No, no, I think, Bard, you answer it, and we'll have an answer for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing is just to put one foot in front of the other and just go. Pick up your backpack and go. Um, there was a... Um, I, I don't know whether you... There's a famous British travel writer called Bruce Chatwin who used to work at uh, Sotheby's uh, as an auctioneer. And when I was 18, I, um, I wrote to them asking for cash. And I quoted uh, Bruce Chatwin, and they gave me 50 quid, and I spent it in the pub. So... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, the best laid plans. Yeah, uh, probably just to uh, start off and uh, don't look back. Yeah. Yeah. Let doors open. Harriet. 
Uh, well, I can't claim to be a travel writer, but my book is just written from the heart, um, just what I observed, and just my own love of the country, really. Um, that's what I yes, I think write from the heart and travel and follow your dreams. TJ, what advice would you give to aspirant travel well, writers? Well, I don't know. I think Bart has given the right advice, but I'd like to share with the audience uh, one of your experiences you're talking about the best experience and meeting Mr. Langlands or Major Langlands, oh, yes. who is a school teacher. Yes, mm. yes. we all school. knew Major Langlands. And he's a sort of uh, hangover from the British Raj. He was a, a major in the army. Mm. Yeah. And uh, he was my teacher, oh. arithmetic oh, teacher yeah. in the Edison oh. College. Oh, right. And a lot of my friends. So um, when Benazir was the prime minister, uh, one of our friends was also a minister in her cabinet, it's Azasan, and I have the story from him, is that uh, Javed Majid, the commissioner of Chitral, knew that uh, Mr. Zardari is very fond of polo. So he used to organize, he used to uh, make these polo matches at Shandur Top, Shandur Pass, popular, the best teams from Gilgit and Chitral would go and play. And this was a polo festival for two, two days. The whole day, the games, the matches would go on, and the best team would emerge, carrying back the prize. So Mr. Langlands arrived at the Polo Festival. And in the meanwhile, uh, Javed Majid had organized to put the cabinet in Lamas and lift them from Islamabad to Shandu Top so they could experience the final of the Polo match. As fortunately, <coughs> Yeah, my friend Etzaz and Benazir were in the same Lama. So they arrived. Some of the Lamas couldn't make the journey, but some of them did. And there when Etzaz saw Mr. Langlands, he said, Ah, Prime Minister, I must introduce you to our arithmetic teacher. <laughs> so he brought the Prime Minister over to uh, Mr. Langlands and said, Mr. Langlands, you know, Prime Minister. So she says, Oh, you taught him mathematics, did you? So he said, yes, and also your minister, Khaja Tariq Rahim, and the speaker of the assembly, and your other minister, Faisal Saleh Hayat, and he went on and on and named about eight ministers who'd been his students. So uh, she said, oh, I should have brought the whole cabinet then. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she, he said, yes, and I would... I put them in class and taught them mathematics for they learnt nothing in school. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, when you go to these giddy heights, um, there's another atmosphere which takes over. Yes, I'm sure you all know how Major Langlands he taught, um, I think for his working life at Aitchison, and then he started a new career and taught in Chitral, which explains his presence in Chitral. And he only died um, this year at age 100. And Two, three, something like that. So there's nothing like the Pakistani fresh air to yeah. the, air. <laughs> the, the, the Pakistani and the apricots. This mm. young lady here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yes. have this lady first. Oh, who's got the mic? Oh, can't see. Oh, you've got the mic. Excellent. Sorry. Um, like you mentioned, you know, Lahore's culture and such. Uh, what is your favorite? Like, what was your reaction when you entered the city, basically, and its culture? What was your favorite part? I just want to ask. Favorite. As a journalist, you could say. When you went in Lahore. Um, in Lahore or in Pakistan? No, in, in Lahore, Lahore actually. Lahore. You came for the wedding. Oh, when I came for the wedding. Uh, probably when an uncle slipped me a cookie loaded with hashish. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the, the uh, brilliance of, um, of most uh, Pakistani weddings is, is overwhelming even. Uh, Particularly the uh, rush to the biryani, but the uh, <laughs> the I, I think actually it was probably my visit to to uh, uh, Data Saab, which in those days had none of the security, of course, that we have now, and I don't think it was so segregated. And the the person who took me there was was r really shared with me what he meant uh, to this city um, and the affection. Um, with which he's held. And, and, and I think that, that really, that sort of started me thinking on the significance of, of, of how Sufism is, is not only a, a form of belief here, but it's sort of become part of the idiom. 
whether it's poetry, literature, thought, um, and how deeply embedded that, that is in, um, in uh, the uh, culture. So yeah, it's probably a dart to solve. Yeah, we have this young lady here, and I'm so, going to ask you. So, you know, Pakistan is a land of diversity. So I just wanted to know your take on the different, like, for example, your experiences in Punjab versus Sindh versus KPK, even with respect to Sufism, are the different cultures. Uh, yeah. Any take on that? And also, Harriet, if you could also answer the same question. Um, well, I, I love listening to Pakistanis caricaturing their countrymen, saying, you know, the Punjabis are this, and the Patans <laughs> are bagal, and the Baloch even more bagal. <laughs> I think I think Pagal is a common theme, but but um, yeah, I mean, for me, for me, uh, yeah, for, for in, in, in each province, um, for example, I mean, I don't want to reduce it to uh, crude uh, generalizations, but I mean, obviously, Lahore is just so vibrant and full of sort of you know amazing food and quite irreverent language, which I won't won't try and replicate now. Um, so, yeah, so obviously that kind of hearty, back-slapping, humorous, uh, devil-may-care sort of spirit. And, it, and in Sindh, I, I found it that you never really got to the bottom of what was going on. There. It's almost as if their character reflects the layers and layers and layers of history um, and kind of quite veiled in terms of what's really going on, particularly if you're looking at peers. Um, and, and well, anyway, I am, I am now reducing this to crude uh, generalization. So, I, so I'm going to stop there. But yes, yeah. uh, okay, Harriet, have you got? I don't really have anything to add to that. But um, the really, difference. my experiences were just in the northern areas. And um, I when you really did see, I mean, one sort of supplementary is, is you did see KPK. I mean, it even changed its name. It's, yeah. It was when the days when you were there. It was NWFP, Northwest Frontier yeah. Province, yeah. and. It changed significantly during that period it, itself and yes, the balance and the makeup Absolutely. because you had all those Afghan refugees coming in. I, when I arrived in 1983, um, and all the time I was in the northern um, areas, I was a young woman alone. I didn't work for any organization, so I had no um, nobody to turn to when things got tough. I, I didn't have a boss or a colleague to refer to. And when I first arrived in 1983, um, things were quite sort of relaxed, you know, I could walk around quite easily, but all the years I was there, I saw the increase in, I suppose, can I say, Islamic fundamentalism and the arrival of the Wahhabis. I used to see them in the old city in Kisakawani. And it became, as a, a, a Western woman for me, more dangerous to travel uh, around in the old city because I was alone, I didn't have a man with me. So um, that in itself was sort of frowned upon. And um, yes, where is your husband? Wh where is your husband? I was asked constantly. Do you have issue? And I was sort of seen as a, a woman of ill repute, really. Um, but Afghans who knew me well and, and traders who I was de dealing with on a daily basis, buying things from them, um, I had, uh, they would, if I needed to go from one place to another within the bazaar, they would send a child with me, uh, uh, you know, one of their sons, to escort me and to um, be my chaperone, really. Um, but towards the end of the 1980s, it really got more and more difficult for me to be there. And I suffered not only verbal abuse, but physical abuse as well. So I decided after eight years to, to call it a day. And so I left. Sure. Yes, I mean, I, th I think that is an, it, it's an interesting aspect that we are looking not just at a society at one moment in time, but we're looking at a society that's, that's also evolving. I want to ask you, Bart, um, were there things that you felt you couldn't book, put in the book? I mean, obviously one can carry on writing and writing and writing, but were there aspects and memories that you felt you couldn't put in or there wasn't space to put in? Um, the only things I left out was um, any episode that... Um, Reflected badly on myself. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> okay. No. But, but no, I mean, obviously, with things like the ISI, I mean, I, I didn't really pull any punches there. Um, and a, a, pub, a very good Pakistani friend said, Look, you want to be careful about saying that Jinnah drank lots of whiskey and smoked 50 Craven A and this sort of thing. But, but I mean, it's a matter of record, so I left it in. So I, I didn't find myself um, uh, self censoring. 
No. At all. But it was just probably what the publisher said, how many words you could write, is what determined what yeah. the length of the book. Yeah, exactly. And, and Harriet, you presumably wrote exactly what you wanted. And Yeah, I wrote exactly what I wanted. And actually, um, I thought the publishers, when they looked at it, would say, well, you can't put that in, you must cut that out. And, but they didn't, so it's yes. all gone no. in, um, um, more or less. That's good. Do we have another question? From, oh, yes. Please, we have, okay. Yes, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and right. panelists. You have traveled and experienced and observed this part of the world, Pakistan, Kabul. How can we establish intellectual culture without emotional... Oh, okay. sorry. How, how can we establish intellectual culture without emotional atrophy? With an uh, emotional... Atrophy. 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 Sorry, yes, right. Atrophy. Oh, gosh. Um, Yes, I think it's, well, it's, it's, academic for me. it's, it's quite an academic question. Um, <laughs> who'd like to answer that? <laughs> I, I, I haven't even understood the question. <laughs> um, but so, over to you. Okay, so, it, so intellectual atrophy. Yes, how, how can we establish culture without intellectual atrophy? It's quite, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, emotional, suffering, emotional. I'm suffering from intellectual and emotional atrophy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So I wish I could be of service. <laughs> if you have any answers, do let me know. <laughs> it's quite a difficult yeah, no, I'm, question. That's way above my pay level, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll think about that. We'll think about a better answer for that one. OK. Um, the next question is this one here. And then we've got two down here. I have a question for Bart. During your travels across Pakistan, did you, was there ever a moment where you felt unsafe or threatened? And if, you, if there, were, there were moments, then what do you do about them? Um, so, I mean, very, very rarely. And, um, I mean, I don't want to hark on too much about Pakistani hospitality, but that, that was the, the most prominent thing. There were a couple of incidents. Um, usually when I was in pursuit of a journalistic target, for example, when um, the conflict in Swat and I was going up into that area, and obviously there were checkpoints and uncertainties as to who was manning them, and that sort of thing. And, and then when, when there was a rough patch uh, in, in the frontier areas of uh, Banu, and I was in there, and, and I walked into a, a district commissioner's office, and he looked at me, he said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, well, I just came to do some reporting. He said, get back across the Indus, and if you come back, I'll send you back handcuffed. Sure. Uh, so uh, in some ways, I was kind of naive in what was really going on. I think there was more yeah, danger than I realized. Yeah. Um, mm. But generally, I was not the target. Uh, even the foreign journalists were not the targets. It was our, our Pakistani colleagues who were targeted, mm. not us. Um, so we lived quite a rarefied lives here. Um, and in fact, I remember covering a, I don't know if you remember, when militants took over the police academy here. And there was a barrage of fire going out, barrage of fire going in. and. Um, I took cover behind the wheel of a truck and I looked in to the truck and there were a number of my Pakistani colleagues, male and female, having lunch. <laughs> so so yeah, fear and perception and fear is uh, relative. Well, I think the um, late Marie Colvin said, actually, on a slightly more serious note, that you don't feel fear until after you've come back. Yes, that's and I think, true. I think that's, very that true. is very true. That's this very lady true. here, we've got about five minutes left. You, yes. Um, I am a visitor to Lahore. I've been here half a dozen times, so I'm not particularly intimate, but I'm quite interested. With the breakdown 20 years ago of the Soviet Union, has there been any increased cultural interaction with the stands of Central Asia, in particular Uzbekistan? And if not, do you see that coming? Do you see more interreaction? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, there's a lot of connectivity issues, and everybody's been waiting. The long-awaited Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, TAPI, the pipeline, um, in, in that regard, which would bring more, more jobs. I heard yesterday in one of the other sessions that um, the Turks were very interested in going into the stands, but then they never got paid for anything, so they pulled out. Um, can anyone else answer that question? In terms of connectivity, TJ? Yeah, well, there's a fair amount of economic activity going on. We had very little trade with, uh, you know, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. And now there is a fair amount of trade. The problem, of course, has been the passage through Afghanistan. 
because that's been troubled throughout. There is no clear system of whether a truckload of something will get across to the other side or not. And uh, it depends on the security situation at that time. And uh, so that seems to be the major issue, and that's also the major issue for TAPI. Mm, because, it is uh, long, long awaited. Uh, you know, the powers that be would like any other gas to reach Pakistan except Iranian. So um, TAPI is obvious, the, uh, the other obvious choice. But uh, culturally, I don't think there's been very much of a... And it's also logistically, I mean, you're talking, I mean, like, and I think geography is so interesting in, in terms of these, like, you look at the map and it all looks flat, but of course you've got huge mountain ranges, which I think is difficult. Mm. All right. I think we had another question just I, here. I yes. have a quick question for the panel as uh, journalists and travel writers. So there's this new phenomenon of social media personalities visiting different countries and foreigners coming into Pakistan and uh, you write books, but now they do Instagram and live streams and things. And there's this been this whole controversy around certain foreigners coming in and the uh, hashtag positive Pakistan. Now, what do you feel is your role in all of this? Or how do you feel that books and travel writers can perhaps um, improve on this or if this or if these two can somehow be integrated and make it into a more positive experience rather than the uh, controversial one that it is right now. Um, are you, by, by the hashtag, are you referring to, for example, the case of a foreign woman who came and said, hey, I'm walking at midnight through uh, Karachi. Exper and experiences like this, but um, other issues as well, yeah. um, perhaps it's portrayed in a certain way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can only say, um, uh, defend uh, travel writing when it's done well is that um, it, it's usually based on, or at least when, it, yeah, um, based on some kind of um, immersion and understanding of the sensibilities of the country in which you're traveling. Um, so it's not a kind of quick grab, a kind of a butcher and bolt operation. Um, but but obviously, yeah, I mean, uh, done badly, then it's then it's as uh, a negative as any sort of a form of social media. I think any journalist will say that uh, the, the sort of soundbite journalism and, you know, the celebrity that might jet in for it and be photographed as though they're doing something useful is not what we, I mean, and I like to think we're all on the same page here, consider to be proper, proper journalism and proper understanding. And I think that's why we all love writing books, because you can put more in a book, you can be more authentic. And it brings me back to my original point about Bard's book and indeed Harriet's and, and TJ's writing, is that what we all aim for is authenticity, so that when the reader picks up the book, they feel it's authentic and they feel what they're reading, they can, you know, they're learning something, but they can identify with um, as well at the same time and I think that's what we all aim for and you know social media has big issues beyond just travel writing um, but it's anything that's instant by definition is not going to be very solid I think do we have maybe one or two last questions we're just almost out of time oh, we are time over oh um, I'd like to thank um, Isambard Wilkinson Harriet Sands and TJ Jahangir very much indeed I hope you've enjoyed this session Thank you, TJ. I tried to yeah. bring everyone in. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah.